Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best founders and investors to help you scale our business from 1 million to 1 trillion. Today's guest comes from Oslo. His name is Egil, the CEO at Unleash. Egil, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And, and uh, it's it's my pleasure. And for the ones who didn't have yet the pleasure to get to know more about you, uh, who is Egil? Please tell us your story until you you were able to start up and leech. Wow. Yeah. Sure. So how far should I go? All the way back from kind of, uh, <laughs> exactly. being the hacker in the basement and where I'm now? Maybe. Sounds great. <laughs> uh, you, know, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm. Um... I always believed I wanted to be a developer. So at uh, growing up, I was the geek uh, in a basement, hacking around on everything that had a CPU. Um, and I did my my major in computer science and started at a company called Tamberg. It's a Norwegian company based out of Oslo again. Uh, it's It was a great company. It was uh, doing video conferencing and it was eventually in, uh, acquired by Cisco. But uh, going in there, doing software business or software development, I... Quite quickly learned that you know I'm I'm I love software development, but I'm not really skilled at it because I met so many bright developers out there. So where I found my sweet spot is basically supporting these guys, being effective, uh, getting stuff done, uh, organized, and 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 basically uh, what what I learned after or when I when I kind of matured in my career, is I, I understood being kind of this this leadership kind of role, making sure. They were able to do what they wanted to do, where they really excelled, and and you know taking away all of the obstacles for them, and 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 getting uh, getting achievements towards the goals we were setting ourselves. So, I I started to move into kind of a more team management, uh, project management, and uh, and after a small step in uh, towards consulting in Accenture, I moved to uh, another Norwegian uh, SaaS company called Visma. Great company. It was a uh, it right. was uh, it was a major M and A machine uh, acquiring a lot of companies and and again it was a it was a thrilling experience being in a border between business tech uh, heading up larger and larger tech organizations and and before I joined this opportunity to to be part of uh, of the founding team of Unleash I I run a company down in in Netherlands or or headed up their product development organization for 450 mm-hmm. people and and I was part of the business and the board and, and board of directors and you know uh every shabung type of a thing so very short Amazing. but very very fast forwarding and, and and that's really great coming from a, a big machine and a big corporate environment to starting up your uh your own company but we will talk more about that later uh let us know also more about unleash i'm i'm, I'm sure that everyone listening is so tell us what is unleash <laughs> what is the problem what is the solution what is, what is exactly. the story <laughs> yeah so unleash unleash is a developer tool uh it's an open source tool so it's available for free and and also of course we have a commercial offering on top of that uh so unleash is a developer tool that basically do what is often referred to as feature management or feature toggling, feature flights. There's uh, many ways of, 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 of telling the same or use it for, for the same name there. So what it does is really supporting developers and developer teams and organizations to basically work in a more efficient way. So, so the core of what it does is to decouple what is called release to production from release to customers. So very simplistic. Um, one of the biggest challenges or one big challenge, a lot of developer teams are are facing is this borderline between you want to get it into production because you want mm-hmm. you know uh, the feedback you not need to validate you want to kind of make sure it works and the only place where it or place the only environment the only 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 uh, conclusion if it really works yes or no it's mm-hmm. uh, it's if it's running live in production now doing that is not something you want to easily do because you don't want to kind of expose your users to failures, bugs, issues, right? You don't want to expose them to half completed features. So think of it as a kind of a magic tool where you can put it in and test it for yourself in production, but don't really enable it for anybody else. And and based on that sort of very simplistic use case, you can start creating a lot of interesting use cases. You can can start doing what is referred to as a gradual rollout, which means... If it works for me, let's test it for myself and my team. If it works for myself and a team, let's uh, start to use include maybe this uh, QA, QA team. If it mm-hmm. works for 
them. Let's include a support team. And if it works for everybody there, make sure maybe we include all of my company. And if it works for my company, it probably works, but let's kind of start increasing then external users. So, so one of many, many uh, possible scenarios that we solve for customers today. Right. And typically the ICP or your ideal customer profile. Yeah. So, I mean, this, you know, uh, it's a very interesting uh, question because software is basically part of any business today. <laughs> right. Uh, so it's uh, tempting to say every business should be our customer. So where we our, find our sweet spot, we are very, uh, very strong on data privacy. So data privacy concerned businesses, very kind of uh, heavily regulated industries such as finance, telcos, life right. science uh, is, is particularly good. Also, governmental areas, um, I would say, is, uh, is, a, is a good sweet spot for us. Yeah. And in terms of size, uh, are we talking um, more enterprise, yeah. mid? We, we mid. find uh, we are building on a SaaS uh, architecture and very flexible architecture. So again, mm. um, how we have created the product, it it's, uh, tends to be very, very good match with larger B2B type of customers. So mid SMB up to enterprise customers is uh, where we find uh, a good match, uh, both for the problem we are able to solve and also our unique selling points uh, as well. Right. And um, of course, uh, I imagine those first moments, maybe you can walk us through a little bit the journey of starting Unleash, uh, hiring the first customers. Yeah. Uh, there is also a curiosity here that you founded a startup with your brother as yeah. co-founder, which I think it's also nice to, to share with the audience what is the experience. I've known other founders in the same spot, but it's all, always this Question on your mind, uh, how will VCs react to have a family member on your founding team? Uh, we also know the same kind of question about couples, uh, husband and wife. Uh, there are investors that like it, other investors that will not invest because of that. Uh, maybe some of them will not be fully transparent uh, about it, but uh, but we know that there is some resistance there. But uh, but anyway, anyway, I'm I'm just thinking out loud about some some Absolutely. scenarios that you that you might have faced as a no no it's uh, it's a, it's a lot of valid points there and I think you're spot on 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 a lot of those so maybe maybe start with where we started this and and, yeah. and some of those uh, very interesting observations uh, a bit later so so Unleash initially was never created to be commercial so it was created uh, out of an engineering organization as you mentioned there is my brother Ivar. Uh, baby brother, he's he's the, he's the developer, by the way. He's the brain in the family. So, so he was uh, basically working uh, and 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 facing this 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 uh, a lot of frustration connected to to the problem we are solving. Meaning, they had kind of all DevOps handbook implemented, which means they have had the, uh, everything automated. They could basically go whenever. They had full support for management, which was also quite often a challenge in a lot of organizations. But they had full support for management to really. You know, do the best practices of engineering, yeah. but they, for so many reasons, they didn't do so. And and exactly the, they, what I, he and in, in, in discovered was exactly this that, you know, it's uh, it's this is risk balance, right? You wanna you wanna you wanna get it there, but you don't. And 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 this catch twenty two is sort of uh, where he gets stuck. Another interesting mention there, in case the audience is very technical, and and stop me if I'm getting too into the details here. <laughs> Um, the, the organization he worked for was also very technology agnostic, meaning they believe that developers should have the best tool of their choice or, or use the preferred programming language that is fit, just fits best the, the problem they're trying to solve, which sounds great, but it also creates a lot of challenges. And one of the challenges was that, of course, you ended up in a very diverse tech stack. So you had the Golang, mm -hmm. you had the Python, you had the .NET, you had the Java, you had the, the full kind of everything. And, and, and when you, when you start thinking about how you really build, create software, which this company were doing, you, you need to make sure that there is a very consistent user experience, right? So if yep. you as a user are going into your retail bank or whatever, and everything starts to be flaky and it sort of really doesn't really make sense, you're getting confused and, and that is not a good experience. So right. um, going into this space, he was also very focused on, I need to have a consistent behavior across all of this. So then it moved into kind of an, and from a small problem into an interesting problem. And, and this is back in 2014. And at the time, this type of tooling was starting to appear to the surface, but it wasn't really anything uh, that was sort of uh, widely adopted in the market. So you had individual tooling for Golang, but Golang only, or into Python and Python only. And, and that doesn't really do the trick because then you lack this sort of across tech stack kind of uh, consistent behavior. So 
So of course, you know, good engineers, they do what they, 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 when it, they don't find a tool, they build a tool and that will happen. Yeah. Um, and, and it was released as an open source project back in 2015 and, and fast forwarding to 2019, uh, it was never anything commercial behind it. It was sort of just growing organically. And this is also what happens uh, and, and, and what the VCs now start to, to, to see is that open source really fits developer tooling well. So, you know, developers, they take the tooling with them when they are moving around and, and open source is super easy to, to bring along because there is no kind of strings attached. You can, you can also contribute back. You can sort of, uh, it's easy to, to get started usually. And, and, and that was happening in this case. So in 2019, it was a very midwinter. We were, you know, uh, hanging out, uh, having a dinner, a couple of beers and starting to kind of joke around and, and he started to talk about this project and, and started also to ask for some my point of view, because, you know, I was more coming from the business side of things. I understood the tech space, but weren't a developer, but I was, you know, um, running product, product marketing product and, and these type of functions. So, so he said that there, there is a lot of pull here. There is a lot of interest. There is a lot of guys basically asking me, is there anything here? What can we do about it? Can I buy, can I get some support? So so that was sort of the the aha moment of good sign. <laughs> this, is like, this is a good sign, exactly right. It's a, it's a, there is something, there is interest. So exactly. so in 2019, what we and and at the time also to add to that, we were you know fortunate. We were in in good positions. We were family guys. You know, we were well established and 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 well paid jobs. So maybe a bit uh, risk averse. We were sort of saying that well. Let's start to pursue it, but don't jump the boat right now, right? Okay. So we decided to 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 um, and and I think that was also a, a good decision back mm -hmm. then. We decided to just sell what we have. So basically, take a very simplistic go to market, mm -hmm. let into a product, uh, start thinking about how can we sell this. Where's the value? Uh, what is the positioning? Is there a competitive? What is the competitive landscape? Is there any? And of course, there were. And 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 in the competitive landscape, where do we fit? Is there a position for us, or is it sort of just another? So, so we, we did a very, uh, very quick uh, product bundling and product go to market. Uh, we spent a month or two just putting up a landing page, you know, kind of this is the offering. This is we, we played around mm -hmm. with that a bit. And, and, and based, on, based on the interest and the, and the already identified market pool, we started to gain a lot of inbound. So meaning customers mm -hmm. willing to, to explore this and, and learn more. And it allowed us to spend about a year talking to, um, I guess, hundred or so customers, real customers looking for, looking for, uh, for, uh, for, for buying this type of product. And right. maybe coming back to a question about, should you go into and into business with your brother uh, or your yeah. sister or your whatever spouse? Um, maybe, maybe not. I, I think that's not an easy answer to, to, to respond to. It was definitely something we were both concerned about. We actually discussed that quite a bit, uh, when we started on, because, you know, when you start, everything is like very interesting. It's like an opportunity. Everything is exciting. And, and we all know right. there will be hard times, there will be <laughs> exactly. uh, difficult decisions. And, and I think that we, we were quite cautious about doing this and also kind of doing whatever we needed to, or at least be very focused on not like, we don't want to kind of jeopardize our relationship because we are the mm -hmm. best friends. We have, you know, brothers and, and tight on, and, and all of that. So, so always reminding, re reminding ourselves that like family first and, and relationship first and, and make, make sure. And, and one thing that we have done through all along the way and that we still do is uh, of, uh, of course, there is a lot of respect, mutual respect. Uh, I also think that we complement complement each other very well. I'm I'm staying out of his uh, his area, and he's pretty much staying outside of mine. And mm -hmm. and whenever we are sort of in the gray area of, of where we are sort of overlapping, uh, we are very focused on if there is a tension, if there is sort of this getting out of a meeting or receiving mm -hmm. an email or a text or whatever. You know, it's it's twenty four seven. Just address it immediately. So. I read this. I'm not sure what you meant, but I felt this is happening. Is this true, or or how, like just address it immediately? Because if it's still small, you can you can touch it. Yeah, and and also we have had a few moments where we didn't agree. Uh, so we were sort of coming to a conclusion that okay, we don't agree. We need to make a decision. We cannot have both. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, and uh, so far we have been able to kind of every both of us have been hurt. We have been able to express our mind and. 
uh, when we have concluded uh, where we need to go on the, on the decision, we have respected that and moved on and never kind of repeated back or, or opening up that conversation. So knock wood, I hope that will continue. It's going to be important, but it's, um, I think it's definitely, and I also know uh, you are not the only one asking. And it's, I think every newcomer to the company is asking, not, not me, not Eva, but everybody else, does this work? Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think it's a very, uh, very common, uh, common uh, concern for, for sure. Absolutely. So and you, you didn't feel any kind of uh, question marks uh, when you you were fundraising and, uh, and so not on? With, um, not with VCs. Um, not with VCs. I um, Maybe we were not talking to, to those that were concerned or, or maybe we came across as uh, quite coordinated and 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 uh, well aligned i'm not sure i never addressed yeah. uh it has but been it also... kind of an interesting twist yeah uh, but it have never been raised as it has been raised as how do you cope with this or how do you deal with this uh, right. i'm aware of that but um i think we are when we started the fundraising the first time or the first uh, the seed round we were already sort of very aware of this and all also building our company we're very focused on building culture the type of culture we are building so i think it comes across that we are not only experienced but also kind of very very cautious of what we are building which i mean maybe give away some sort of security or trust that it's going to work i'm not sure but you never know yeah but, and, and that's true. We know that uh, founder conflicts uh, is also one of the most common reasons of failure in startups. And uh, and to be honest, uh, as you are family, you will always need to <laughs> to face each other. So I think that the risk uh, in having a family member in the company might be even lower than having a person uh, that maybe, you, maybe that not. you will not need to cope <laughs> with. It depends, I, right? I think creating a founding team is extremely hard anyways, because you yeah. need to have the ultimate trust. You need to really, really know. And, 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 you know, everybody's excited when it gets started, but when, when, when the shit hits the fan and everything gets heated, this right. is what you really our need to kind of go back to that fundamental trust level of trust. If you don't trust, or is there any level of mistrust? Uh, I think it will be, it doesn't really matter if your brothers or your, if your pals. I mean, fo forming a business with a friend, I think that would be even more concerning, to be honest. Got it. Got it. Good, good points. And uh, and again, uh, for the ones who are listening to us, they might be asking, "What is the stage of growth that you that you are in?" So yeah, if, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, we are uh, we closed our series A last uh, last year. So so end of last year, we are, I think we announced in in March and this year. No. Sorry, not this year, the last year we all last year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm having the same kind of issue. Uh, we are recording this on the 31st of January. It should yeah, be released correct. in February. So, so we closed, <laughs> uh, we closed uh, late 21 and announced um, Q1 2022. Got it. Cool. So uh, in, in terms of ad count, where, where are you landing? Uh, right now we are... 32, I believe we are kind of onboarding quite a bit of people right now. Uh, I need to say also, we have decided to be kind of a conservative from compared to a lot of other startups right. we have. Uh, and this is also maybe uh, we, we touched a bit on this briefly coming from a large organization is sort of, I would say, yeah. bringing that large corporation experience is both a very strong asset, but also kind of a liability because it's an asset in the sense that there is this fundamental understanding of kind of cost control and kind of planning and kind of uh, execution and efficiency type of thing. That's usually what when you when you start adding up in, in large organization, you are you need to be on top of the cost and you need to be on top of the efficiency and need to you you know what really looks uh, great looks like, right? Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, of course, the 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 liability part I would say is sort of uh, organization, large organizations, there is less pressure to kind of make success. Mm -hmm. And there is sort of, you have deeper pockets for sure that you can kind of right. allow yourself to fail to, to a lot of, to a different extent. Uh, and, and usually also you are depending on organization, it's, uh, it's, uh, more or less fast, fast paced. So I, I, I would say I'm, uh, I'm, um, my experience coming from this, my I experienced that as a very uh, fast-paced organization, although it's a 12K type of, uh, of uh, headcount company. Yep. Um, but at the same time, 
I think the biggest uh, difference in a in a startup is that every everybody needs to mature so quickly from one level. Right. You, you start as a team lead, right? And and you build up uh, the, the first founding team. There is like two people, maybe three, maybe I don't know uh, what is. Yeah. The but then you kind of are are ex- executing as a team lead, and eventually you start having going to twenty people, which is sort of maybe where we start adding kind of identified persons to taking care of, and 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 you get one Excellent. level. Yeah. And and when you start moving to I don't know 30, 50, you start maybe having more kind of so and, and also the expectation is going so quickly. It, it the learning curve is so rapidly changing the expectations and also the, the requirement of two or three quarters set. and you are in a different organization. Yeah. And and you can you can look look back and, and one year later you are totally different. You are like the expectations and, and where you are. And and also when you are building the foundations, it's so extremely important to get talents on board you need to have really really strong talents at the same time it's so difficult to get those like large corporate uh, like talents coming into because it's so hands-on so you need to really exactly. do, do do the stuff you need to really roll off the sleeve so i think we've been very fortunate on getting very talented people on board and and also they are coming open-eyed saying okay i understand i need to do what i say and i i, I know where i want to go and eventually i will have a team but now we need to kind of prove that system works and 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 i think this is a very interesting challenge uh, compared to a, a large organization yeah I, I agree that this there is clearly a trend of having uh, much more controls uh at count nowadays and also i would say a common pattern of the conversation that we have on the show is uh, having more less people and more senior uh, people. But, but let, let's describe senior um, in a sense that they are able to think to think strategically, but also to be able to, to do stuff uh, operationally. And yeah. uh, this is the difficult part of finding someone who is able to bridge well the operational, the tactical and the strategical uh, yeah. layers usually it's very difficult to find someone with uh, with that profile and that's why it's so critical for the zero to one uh, before starting to go the from the the one to ten and of course the one to ten also brings uh, difficult challenges because you are already more like a large organization but you still need to behave and make things uh, with with the resources of a, a small uh, organization <laughs> yeah no and and if I may add uh, another yeah, absolutely observation is uh, is is this uh, coming from a, a large organization and in particular on large organization that was owned by a private equity that was very focused on cost uh, yeah. control um also keep in mind that uh, putting constraints in place is uh, causing focus or or requiring focus so constraints would what i mean is basically cost and time so if you are i mean you if the easiest thing you can do is to add more people right but if you really want to make sure you are getting the right things done maybe you should not add people actually remove people because yeah. what that forces you is to really it will the first reaction is there is just too much to be get done. I'm going to get overloaded. And I'm not saying that everybody should work 24-7. I'm saying you need to sit down and really look at what is important for you now and what is the most important uh, task that needs to get done for you to get one step further. And if you start adding those constraints, you will also force the organization into making this decision. So e- well, either you end up being outburned and that's not the intention there so be very clear right. about I'm not asking people to work 24 7 365 right. but I'm saying control the number of hours you work but be very not add more hours also forces you into priorities yeah and if you are making this successfully you are probably going to run much faster compared to adding you know going from 50 to 100 people is like the add the the additional hours or outcome you get uh is is getting less and less uh so actually you should be very concerned about actually adding people i would say yeah especially in those first uh, two or three quarters when you had a lot of people and a lot of them they didn't have a good onboarding if they don't understand the vision how they can contribute it can be even working the opposite you will way be getting yourself into a mess for sure <laughs> <laughs> But but also look at the large organization during this downturn. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it's. I'm actually a bit surprised to be frank, if I if I may, uh, a bit surprised that we don't see more layoffs because there is 
this is a great opportunity. I'm not saying this because I want people to get out of jobs, but of I'm course. saying it yeah. because uh, it is a, it's a good opportunity to again, kind of really uh, focus the organizations back to where what is really essential and what is really needed. And and you know, there's so much talent around, like like experienced people of all of these very successful tech companies that probably should go out there and just start something for themselves. They are more than experienced enough. And 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 uh, and uh, and currently, I think this. Um, I think this this uh, this current economical environment is uh, is a great opportunity for all organizations. Yeah, and and something interesting also is um, to to focus more on accountability on what are the KPIs that we need to be able to drive forward instead of uh, on roles and and functions, especially at, at let's say from the ten. From zero to ten, it's impossible to think about roles, right? From from ten to fifty is is really trying to not have so many uh, titles and have much more KPI or OKR oriented uh, responsibilities, and then having transparency, clarity of vision, and trying to learn as quickly as possible. What are the main metrics that we need to to work towards, right? Yeah, no, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I think it's also. Uh, one of the other really big challenges we see because you 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 are you are going into this area where you sort of are as you say you're exploring you're learning you're growing and mm -hmm. and 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 uh, and one of the patterns we are seeing is that we are revisiting a lot of conclusions saying oh was this really correct or or is exactly. this and false positive or 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 is this really good enough and and then you start seeing a bit of a misalignment on on the ambitions which is sort of a good observation to make because you want to set the ambitions like sky high uh, but then again, what does that really mean? And, and what does that mean? And also one of the, the big challenges in this again is sort of you want to set the ambitions high, but you don't want to set it that high that you cannot uh, execute because if everything needs to be perfect, you are not kind of getting execution into place and you need execution. In. Right. So, so this sort of uh, balance of execution and perfection is, uh, I think, an, 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 uh, an uh, intention that um, I'm quite sure most founders is really feeling every day. Right. Uh, I, and I agree with that point. Typically, what I like to say is on the quarterlies, we can talk about strategy during the quarter. We are not allowed to talk about strategy, but then we need to keep agile. And of course, if we if we believe that we are working on something that doesn't need to be done at all, let's not sh just not check the box to say that we have done it because it is not serving us to move into, into that direction. Because if not, also... I think that as founders, we have a different mindset. And if we talk with other team members, they think that just because we are talking about a certain scenario, we are saying, we are telling them that we would be moving uh, into that scenario and that they should be executing already. On that scenario. And we are just brainstorming about options <laughs> and, and not telling we want to go in that direction and let's completely change plans. I, I've seen this happen again and again and again. And uh, a lot of founders not having the space of speaking to someone on a brainstorming mode or even just, you know, ventilating what is going on on their minds. Uh, and not being with their teams because their teams are really already trying to understand. So how do I translate what my uh, what my CEO or what the founders are telling and what sh what is expected from me to make that happen? Right. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, that's uh, that's a brilliant uh, observation, and I think also taking it back to kind of the the, the large organization experience there. Uh, to me, it sort of comes back to or 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 boils down to you, you need to understand the role you're playing because i'm here i'm agile i'm my I'm, I'm i'm just like a, any other person and i'm not saying that i'm i'm, I'm not because I, I definitely are but uh in a company i i am a ceo and the, i am the co-founder so whatever i'm saying that even though i'm just getting around brainstorming really kind of playing with ideas what i say matters right or it should matter for a company and 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 it and and it's I think it's important also to reflect as a CEO or co-founder or any kind of leadership position in a startup that the role that you're playing matters to other people and and the word you're saying also are weighted differently based on the role you're playing. Uh, some of the roles are formal, so the CEO is a very formal uh, role, and the same with a, as as a, as a founder or a co-founder. Some of them are informal, meaning you are uh, you know industry expert brought to the company and you kind of play and whatever but still right. the word you're saying will kind of be weighted differently compared to some of the others of course because you have this uh, the reputation you have 
yeah so sometimes it is good to have someone outside the company it might be a friend an advisory board member whatever it is that you can talk about those ideas because as naturally as founders you always have plans and with different scenarios on your mind you see so many opportunities that you are not able to embrace all of them and you need to talk with somebody about about those if not you you will implode or <laughs> explode yeah, or, but, or, uh, but, but i think you can also achieve the same internally because i think definitely the company should be included in this and, and probably there is a lot of knowledge at the company but just state um, it that you are brainstorming there and we're very yeah. transparent that this is this is me seeking advice from you guys but not moving in this direction exactly uh and 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 i think it's um i mean not one assuming of, anything <laughs> no exactly not assuming and 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 and, and have respect for 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 the role you're playing i would say yeah yeah and the good point that you also mentioned is is really understanding the difference of being the ceo of the company and the founder of the company and uh, kind of the founding team conversations with the leadership team conversations especially on this transition from uh, a startup to to a scale up uh, mm. that it could be also have this strange feelings that we have the founders and then we have the 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 leadership team uh and and the founders are kind of the bosses of the of the leadership team which is not a very let's say healthy uh feeling for for the leadership team members no i can definitely see some uh, tensions uh be be uh, coming to to surface there so for us we haven't really uh had that challenge yet i'm sure at some point that will be uh be, uh, be a challenge because you know there 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 is different skill sets needed across the journey of the company and i think also um also as as a as a founding team as well as the the early leadership team that is a conversation you should start doing very or having very early that there is different skills required for different phases of the company i mean uh, setting up a company and, and running a, a one to a series to one and, and one to ten is a very different ball game than going ipo and some yeah. are kind of growing together with the company some is not really eager to move into those kind of task and challenges and and some doesn't really have the skills that that's also okay i mean we are yep. we have different talents and 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 that is that is not me not being a good person it's just my skills is uh, exactly. fit for a type of, of operation and so i think that is um i think it's a, it's a good thing for all uh companies that starts to get some traction to having these conversations it's only and just having this mindset that okay. different uh different uh parts of the journey requires different skill sets and, and we see that as the ecosystems mature and we have more companies in later stages uh, of growth, you are able to do several times. And we are seeing very a lot of executives and even other in other roles of the company just going from A to B or from A to C or, uh, or just getting after uh, post C. Uh, there is not so many options there, I know. But typically from A to C, formally, we have much more options nowadays than what we mm. had kind of three years or five years uh, ago. And we are seeing also in Europe, not only in the in the Valley or, or New, New York or, or London, more opportunities to specialize ourselves and to, and to be able to say, I'm, I love to do one to 10 and that's what I like to do. Maybe sometime I would like to try from 10 to 25, uh, but, uh, but, but, but that's fine. And I, I did my job and I will go uh, do again my job for, mm -hmm. for another company. And again, it was, it would not be possible for that company to get to the 10 if it was not my job. And uh, yeah. so the company will always be grateful for, the different service that different people offer to the company in different stages uh, of of growth, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that is uh, expected, and I think that is also healthy. Uh, but I think it's also there is a, a interesting challenge there because you know, um, let's say we start seeing those experts going from from uh, A to a C or A to a B or B to a D, whatever. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the biggest challenge, or or at least my personal worries, is that I. I'm very afraid of kind of repeating the successes of the past because it was a success in the past. Right. So I think it's sort of this this balance of yes, you have the playbook, you know, sort of the drill, you you are you've seen it before, but also be very mindful of the context. Uh, there is a different market, a different culture, a different company, a different founding team. There's a different uh, um, economical environments you you are operating in. So 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 i think the best executors will and operators will be those that sort of have the experience but also have the curiosity of learning and growing and looking at every opportunity as a, as a new opportunity where they can learn more 
good point. And uh, we, we, we talked a lot about leadership, culture, uh, having the right people on, on the right seats, understanding that we might need different people for different stages of growth. And this is nice and addressing it uh, quite early. Also being uh, having a trusting environment, being able to, when you see something that might be weird to attack it directly, namely when when you have a co-founder being a brother or not, uh, it is important to 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 have a an healthy relationship and to always be nurturing that relationship and ensuring that uh, you address any single issue that might be uh, an issue uh, right on. And I think that this kind of advice also works for any kind of relationship, not only for for co-founders, right? Uh, even with with your wife or or husband or friends, uh, it definitely. Uh, helps even with your with your father with your mother <laughs> with your kids no, no, that, <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> what's a good point you, you know it's a good point but you know it's uh it's uh it also points out that building a company is basically about building people and building relationships and exactly and investing in those uh, relationships as well so so you know by, by the end of the day business is about people Absolutely. And and talking about other kind of people, any lessons that you'd like to share about your different rounds in terms of fundraising, any any advice that you'd like to to share or or just your stories? Uh, yeah. No, I I yeah, advice. I mean, I'm I'm maybe easier to tell the story than, than right. I mean everybody's different, but but I think um one of the key takeaways obviously uh if you are if you are able to i would say pay attention to and really spend some time to learn the investors that you want to go with because it's kind of a long-term relationship and again it's a relationship so so we were in a and when we did the seed we were in a fortunate position where where we had multiple options and and um and uh and by the end of the day it's sort of you you just need to sit down and, and see where it does all of the where where do you kind of get all of those expectations that this will be a good long relationship and and I, and I think we we made some some good judgment there. I mean, uh, nothing wrong with those we didn't decide to go with, but it's sort of um, sometimes you just click differently with somebody else and 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 listen right. to, to that as well. Of course, if if you had opportunity. Uh, another is uh, uh, when we did the uh, another experience that that we took uh, with us. It's also like we we have been a bit opportunistic meaning when it uh, when we did the say uh, the, the a maybe it was a bit premature uh given the numbers given everything and and this was remember back when everything was kind of everything was super high value and everything was just going crazy so it was sort of the opportunity came along uh again it was uh where we when we decided to go together with with spark and and from the first conversation it was like a very very uh good uh conversation uh it was a very informed conversation with a very kind of um uh, aligned set of values so so mm -hmm. also bringing on investors is part of building the company culture uh, as, as as we see it so so we saw that there was uh there was a good match in 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 in, in their reputation in their value in in, in a partner Natalie that we work with uh, came across as a very well informed and very kind of skilled person to 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 um, to 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 interact with. So so when the when the opportunity came along, it was sort of just take it. Uh, maybe we could have gotten a better evaluation if everything continued uh, another twelve months because we were not meeting all of those. You know, there is always some numbers that you should and and so forth. Right. Uh, but of Not course, all the boxes of the SaaS napkin, right? <laughs> exactly on the SaaS napkin. There, there you go. So, but but the opportunity were there, and 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 it was sort of a good good deal for for them probably, and it was a good deal. Or I know it was a good deal for them, but it was also a very good deal for us. And in retrospect, I mean, we can foresee that the two months later, it was sort of just everything was going down the drain right. and being went dark. So. Uh, of course, now in retrospect, it was super smart, um, <laughs> but it, it was sort of uh, fortunate and also kind of uh, grabbing opportunity type of thing. Um, I think this is different from every founder and, and the risk appetite and how we want to build a company is different. But our experience were uh, when there is a good match and when you sort of trust that this is going to be a healthy relationship, uh, why not make it a go and... and and sort of be, be, be maybe share a bit of of the upside as well that um 
that uh, that is part of investing in the relationship how, how we see it yeah and uh, i know it's super difficult also being able to manage the the momentum of the market to anticipate a bit the round or to postpone a bit more the the round and extend the the runway mm. um yeah and by the book we know that we need to raise every 12 to 18 months but but then reality is a different story so being flexible understanding those momentums and being able to speed up or to put a little bit of uh, a break uh, in the pedal is uh, is something important uh, as a founder and, and this is something difficult to 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 share because uh, it, it comes a little bit more from the intuition from the experience from yeah. from the feeling right yeah yeah and i think experience there is uh, is a key word again i'm i'm i think i'm coming across as i only look at experience as the only superpower but it's sort of uh it's sort of this uh being being part of of other organizations seeing other businesses being operated and and, and built it sort of also gives you a perspective of how you want to build your company right so so it's important also to trust yourself and trust your gut and trust because you are building your company, not building the company for somebody else. But if, if you do, well, if you are in hire, of course you are. But if you are a founding right. team, uh, you need yeah. to trust them. And as long as you are in seat, um, I think you need to to listen to what is important for yourself and the type of company and and the decisions because the decisions you make is also the culture you're going to create. So so it's um, something to pay attention to for sure. Great, great tips. And I feel that we could go on and on. And uh, I would love to also pick your brain a little bit more about international uh, expansion, but uh, just quick thoughts there. Are you going through Nordics, UK, US, no. directly to the US? Just uh, Yeah, so, yeah. so when, we, when we started to assess this space, we we it, it was kind of obvious, as I said, that we were selling a software tooling for a software developer and software development is sort of core at, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the traditional quote there for every business. So it was a traditional problem. So it's a, it's a not like a, a anything uh, based on legislation. There is not a, like a regional need or, or anything kind of. So, so the, the problem space for us was global, which means we could basically go anywhere we wanted. Uh, of course, we are based out of Oslo, Norway, so the founding team is based here, and uh, we decided to start looking at the market from where, where, where is the interest? Where do we go? So, uh, one of the learnings uh, we did, we we obviously the first couple of kind of customer calls we tried to engage were, you know, from local network. You know, we we had our network, we were kind of calling them in position, saying, oh, we have this great tool, and and it it fits your business perfectly, and. The, the takeaway there of to, to fast forward is it's super easy to get those meetings. So you get into a meeting, you get into kind of sitting with the customers and they are, or customers, and, and they are super eager to listen to what they're saying. And then everything goes quiet and you start to kind of understand, you, you struggle a bit to understand why. And of course, the problem is that it's sort of a, like a, a favor for, for a connection, a friend, a, right. a somebody in, in your network. And they're not in a mood or in that kind of where they are to to really buy this this product so 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 one of the experiences we, we did take away is when we brought in more kind of experienced salespeople to the team that i really advise to do very early on it's super helpful to have mm -hmm. like really experienced salespeople that's you need to sell immediately and 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 that is sort of understanding also in a more methodical way who is really looking and who is really having the budget to buy and who is really having a pressure? Is there any, any reason for them to buy? And, and when you are in those, you know, selling to your pals and, and friends, they are not really buying. They're just right. friendly. Uh, so I, I would say, don't waste time on that. Just go and, and, and engage with the customer where they are. So in our case, uh, the majority of the traction uh, came from the U S. So even though we were based out of Oslo, uh, obviously, U.S. market was uh, our primary market from day one, and um, of course, that comes with its own type of, of challenges: uh, international trade, laws, tax, and all of those interesting parts. But you know, it's uh, you need to you need to be where your customer is. So that's my biggest uh, or most simple advice. Great, great points, and also using kind of inbounds to understand where the demand uh, is coming it's from. Possible, obviously. We were in a good position with open source that there was a lot of uh, 
traffic and, and inbound. So that was uh, really supporting us to guide us to where, where we needed to, to invest. And that kind of inbound also validates that, uh, that the problem exists, that there is an ICP that is looking to solve that, that problem. Because sometimes founders also try to do to start a, a lot with outbound from day one, trying to take every deal. Um, there are pros and cons on on both approaches, uh, but uh, but definitely, if you are able to attract uh, potential leads from a landing page and validate a problem, it shows that uh, there is potential uh, there. If you need to. Um, if you need to go through a lot of doors to be able to to sell your products, uh, it might show that you might want to reconsider. Uh, it doesn't mean there is no no demand, but uh, yeah, it's always difficult to to say. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But but again, uh, and and coming again again to to hire a salesperson early in a, in a phase, I would say yeah. Uh, having a person that has experience to really kind of understand where is the value, because you know um, my experience with the with sales is that they are super eager to close business, right? That's what they do yeah. every. That's that's what they what they're doing. So, so they they are looking at your product from a totally different view. They're looking for where is the value for the customer and really what type of right. problems are, are the problem the, the the product selling. And if you can't even have a, a get a salesperson on the team, that is good. That is a good. Probably point. have a problem to sell the product. Exactly. In the so, so um, I think we were maybe a bit late, but then again, getting the the first salesperson really ex, uh, uh, accelerated. Great advice there. Yeah. Really, really good point. Uh, if a salesperson is not interested to sell your product, uh, big red flag. <laughs> <laughs> they believe they will not be successful with your product, and they will not make their bonus and their nope. commissions, and they will go look for another company, another product. <laughs> so they are very opportunistic in that sense, uh, and we need them. <laughs> no, and and in the early days, again, going going back to the early days. I mean, um, being opportunistic, I think that is a great uh, thing to do. You should. Uh, you should make a lot of really horrible deals. And I'm still joking with my sales team that there is so much cleanup in, in the early days from, from deal making. But then again, it's sort of getting some cash on the, on the table and really starting to engage and do that learning is super important. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will continue to make really bad deals and really looking back a year from now saying, Oh my God, what is this the deal we're able to, to make? But it's, you know, it's, it's about uh, it's about building the reputation, building the brand, building the kind of the market presence, and 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 I look at it more as this company than anything else. Even though there are some definitely some uh, let's say interesting uh, deals in in our portfolio. Love it, great points. So let's let's go to the last segment of the show where I ask you a, a quick uh, question and you please kindly give me a, a brief answer. Uh, so let's start with the first one. If you would have a, an opportunity to have a coffee with yourself at the beginning of Unleash, uh, what advice would you offer to your younger self? Uh, good one. I think this is a very difficult one, but I would probably say don't be afraid to fail. Um, I mean, you're going to fail and it doesn't really matter because you're going to pick it up and, and, and course correct. And this is a good point, especially from someone who has a, a career like you or uh, having a very good life and a very good career. There is more at risk from a psychological uh, perspective, right? Uh, from a rejection uh, perspective as well, the fear of rejection might might be uh, higher. What people will think about me. <laughs> <laughs> What are you the most proud of on your journey so far? I would say I'm, I'm the most proud of the team we have been able to establish. Um, the team is top notch. Uh, the team is really super highly engaged. Their team is really loving, or at least they say they love to work with this company. Uh, they are very, they they are they're really pushing us to the next level every day, um, and. And and more than anything, I very proud of the mutual respect I see between the cross-functional or the functions functional areas. So, right. uh, sitting in in town hall meetings and listening to developers like embracing how great salespeople are. I've never seen that in any software company before, and That's and awesome. equally equally proud to to listen to salespeople being like stars in their eyes when the developer is saying, "Oh." One last thing, I, I had some hours le- last night and, and you mentioned this feature. And by the way, um, let me make a, wow. a, a demo for you. 
Great that culture. is sort of wow. Uh, and and uh, just being able to sit down and just l- allow the people to be on stage and, and really kind of uh, do these things is uh, it makes me really, really, really proud. Worst advice ever received. I have the playbook. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's some advice. But... I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be careful with that one <laughs> to not be one of those. <laughs> but but usually I always say that uh, yeah, yeah no. I have a framework, but uh, but I would need to adapt the framework to the stage yeah, of growth exactly. of the team. Exactly. Yeah, and, and and you get my point. Uh, I I am definitely looking for playbooks and and best experiences and and best practices, yeah. but it's always. Uh, different there's always a different kind exactly. of twist. So fully agreed yeah. if you if you come across to me with sort of i know how to solve this you probably haven't understand anything and then you will not uh, get a lot of uh, attention from my end <laughs> that's great and now the resources your favorite book business or non-business yeah. you decide oh, um so many um the one that i'm i'm spending most uh, time now i think it's actually a norwegian book but it's also available in english it's called rockets and rebels uh it's a very simplistic way of how you build a brand uh, and and how you build the strategy and, and corporate brand management and, and strategy together in some in a very sort of easy to understand but very to the point type of uh, of of way which um I find very useful. I, I return to this again and again and again and again, and and I really encourage everybody that is in in C to seek it and 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 get some inspiration from it. Thanks for sharing. And favorite movie or series? Um, so many. Um, I would say more. Maybe may maybe more of the um, uh, Mulholland Drive is a is a long term favorite. Um, okay. So, so um, it's, it has been a few years since I saw it last time, but it's sort of one of those very interesting movies that you just sit down, what happened really there. And, and every time you see it, you're getting a new observation and you still doesn't get it really. <laughs> cool. And your favorite podcast, excluding this one. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'm not allowed, I guess, to say this. <laughs> exactly. So... No, I would say there are so many good arounds. I mean, I, a lot of interesting episodes on, on Freakonomics Radio, uh, for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. Also, I really like to geek around with uh, podcasts such as Inside Running um, and, and and similar type of, of more sports type of things. So, But uh, both of them are really, really strong. Egil, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much for making the time and uh, all the best for, for the next chapters. You are always welcome. Thank you, and and it was a great uh, it was great uh, honor to be invited, and and uh, it was a blast conversation. Thank you very much, and to our community, as you see, we keep bringing you the best of the best to make your life a little bit easier as you scale your business. See you soon, and keep scaling.